A fraction is a number. A number, a fraction is not a shape, so you, know, you have to define a whole precisely. The whole is the length of the segment. And you take, you partition it, what do you mean by partitioning? Dividing into equal parts, you mean you are divide, partitioning it into segments of equal length. All right? So when you divide, or I, I, I try to say partition, but sometimes I lapse into divide. I don't want to use divide as much as I can because divide carries the connotation of division. And we're not talking about division right now, you see, so I try to say partition, but I may not be able to do it all the time. So you partition it into, say, say three equal parts. That means what? You have three segments of equal rank, one, two, three, and this. And, and well, one part in, uh, what, what, normally you say one part out of three equal parts, that's one third, like this your normal uh, perception of what a fraction of, of one-third is. Well, except in this case, you see, it's there. We, 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 this is favored. Of course, now, uh, I have one, one, one your attention. Yeah. This one, the third segment, of course it's also a third, of course. That's a third, right? But the first one is favored because it starts from zero. It's easier it's, you know, From the beginning, I go a third of the distance. We favor that, so we favor this segment to think of as our prototypical representation of a third. Once you've done, once you've done that, then the right end point may as well be identified with the concept of a third. And that's the transition from one part out of three equal parts, from that sort of complicated conception, to something simple, one third. Now this transition is actually important because we, as I mentioned last hour, we want every number to be one single entity, not like, <coughs> well, as I mentioned, the thing wrong with decim decimal, the way it's taught in TSM is, decimal is so many little tidbits <coughs> chunk together, so many tens, so many hundreds, so many thousands, so what is the whole thing anyway? That's all you need to know. It's a one single object. So fractions is a single object, namely one third is what? And not divide something into three equal parts and then take three. No, it's that point here, right here. What is that point? Then you, then you explain it. <laughs> one thing, one point. A fraction is a single object, namely that particular point on the number line. Okay? So, once you have that, then of course you go on. If that one is one third, well, the second thing is two thirds, the third thing is three thirds, and fourth thing is four thirds, five thing is so on. So all the fractions with denominator equal to three are now paraded on the number line. Straight down. And in this way, they, they get to see, for example, why is three over three over equal to one? Well, everything is a point on the number line, right? Three over three, which point is it? Well, it's exactly one, you can see it. Six over three, what is it? Well, it's exactly the point, so that's why you say they're equal. Six over three equal to two, because they're the same point. You can see for yourself. Now, we, we, once you have this, okay, so now, so now we have basically systematically replaced this concept of part of a whole with certain points on the number line. The points are not arbitrary, they're very precisely defined, but they are, they are now firmly established on the number line in a very precise way. So, two-thirds is two-thirds and so on, and seven-thirds is seven over three. So you can see by the so I use different color to emphasize the fact that, the, you, I mean, not for you, I mean, if you teach, you tell them what the numerator say. The numerator, numerator serves a function, then it, it tells you, when you go along the sequence of thirds, so to speak, how far you go. Seven tells you, start at the seventh step. So that's and so in general, so the m, m over 3 is what? It's the nth unit, nth point in the sequence of curves. Uh, yeah, so now this is important because the way we got the, the way we get the, se the sequence of curves. Now if you close your eyes for a minute, instead of saying this is one third, think of this as actually one, that this whole sequence of thirds has become the whole numbers. Correct? 
So you see, fractions are really related to whole numbers in this sense. Sequence of thirds, what well, you can think of that is a sequence of whole numbers. Sequence of fourths, same thing, is a sequence of whole numbers. <coughs> Conceptually, it's the same progression. One, two, three, four. Only difference is the whole number is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Well, sequence of fifths, for example, is one over five, two over five, three over five, four over five. But well, it's the same thing. You just go down the line equidistant in this equidistant way. And this establishes your conception, students' conception of fractions. Namely, in many ways, they are just like whole numbers. And now, so this is a quick way about no, instead of third, you talk about fifths. And then you, so what's a over five? Well, the five tells you this is how you divide the unit segment into a partition of the unit segment into five parts of equal length. And the eighth in the numerator tells you you go down the sequence of fifths. How far? Well, eighth time. Stop. That's it. Okay, so for, we haven't done anything about zero, so this is a formality, we just fix it. Once I've done that, then, um, yeah, so also all the fractions in this way, you can see, right? so this is sort of informal, you can see that. All the fractions are now can be put on the number line in this very precise way, very orderly and precise way. And so with all that, with this, yeah, so, so yeah, this is to emphasize, repeat what I said. We don't want students to say a over five is three things. There's an action <coughs> divide the five part and take eight. Not none of that. It's one single object, one point. What point? Well, I tell you how to get to that point. So you divide the unit segment into five, uh, partition it into five equal parts. You get a sequence of fifths. You go down eight steps. That's where you are. But ultimately, the most important thing is that this is one thing. Namely, a certain point on the number line. Right. So, the same thing for the, for the rest. So now the formal definition is, so I, I, don't, I don't want to repeat that. You make it formal. So, M over N is a certain point on the number line. What point? Well, divide the unit segment. Partition the unit segment into N equal parts. You get a sequence of N. You go down n steps, you stop there, that is the point which we call m over n. So this is a formal repetition of what we have done intuitively. Now, having a definition, so I'm repeating one of the sort of minimal mathematical requirements. What's the point of having a precise definition? Well, it's a double-edged double -edged sword. It's a little unpleasant at the beginning when you're not used to it. You see, I cannot just say, well, that's a pizza. So much easier. You know, if I say a number line and this and that. Well, okay. It's a little inconvenient for you at the beginning. You get used to it in that thing, right? So let's say you are put up with a little inconvenience. What do you gain from it? What you gain from it is that there's no more guessing games. Every time you come across a fraction, you want to do something about it. What do you have to do? Well, it goes back to the number lines and do it there. You, well, at least, I'll illustrate it in no time flat, all right? So don't worry about it. But I'm just telling you, a definition serves you and serves the students at the same time. Now, the second big topic of our fraction is, what well, in fact is the biggest topic in the study of fractions. The single fact about equivalent fractions. So you, with, with, with fifth graders, fourth graders, you just say that first, but among adults, not mature adults, you just say it in one lump sum, namely, what is it? This is what it says. Any fraction k over l is equal to the other fraction ck over cl, where c is any non-zero number, non-zero whole number. That's a whole statement. Now, you don't want to say this to a fifth grade at the beginning, but, but among us, that's what we want to set the stage. Set the stage, so that's what, what we say. TSM would have you believe that this is only good for simplify, simplifying fractions. It's completely wrong. This is the single most important fundamental fact in the study of fractions. If you do something about fractions, somehow it does not come up. This fact about equivalent fractions does not come up. You can be sure you probably have made a mistake. You probably have made a mistake. It must come up. 
no matter what you do, it's going to be there. Okay, so now let's explain this. Now, so I can, okay, let's do this first, right? Why is 7 over 3 equal to 14 over 6? Don't forget, 14 is 2 times 7, and 6 is 2 times 3, right? Now, TSM, typical TSM says this. Everybody knows it now. I hope there's no exception, right? This is what TSM does every time. <coughs> Am I right or wrong with this? <laughs> is that? You know what's wrong with this? You don't know how to multiply fractions. Exactly. The, the, the square, the blue square, what do we call it? Green, what do we call it? That doesn't make any sense. Because, right, they barely know a fraction as a piece of pizza. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by this? What's, what's this all about? <laughs> so I tell you, from classroom experience, the uh, Two possible reactions. The first one, this is so cool, right? That's how you multiply fraction. That's how we're going to add fraction. In the universities, we keep saying, "How come our income is fraction?" Now, at Berkeley, at Stanford, by the way, we get students like that. Not all, not many, but they do that. They add the fraction by adding numerators. Yeah. So we say, so we we will do it. They are nice. Why on earth they do this? And I make a guess, right? but you start with things like this, well, what other conclusion can they draw? I mean, after all, if you, you don't tell me what multiplication is, you just say, do it. Well, then, of course, I can just improvise, can I not? Right? I add, okay, I don't need to know what adding is, but I do it exactly. <laughs> the other one is total despair. I don't know what it is. You're telling me that's what I do? I don't mind doing it, except that I'm not going to go along with you any further than this. You want to tell me I follow, but I don't want to ask. That is that phobia. Come on. That's what TSM does. So you know, All right, now let's do it again. Why 7 over 3 equals 14 over 6? Now I come to what I said about fractions. How is it double S sort? Yeah, there's a little bit of unpleasantness at the beginning for you when you're not used to it. Once you get used to it, that's not a problem, right? Let's say at the beginning you're uneasy. But now, but it makes it so easy for you. You want to say, why this is true? It's so simple. There's nothing to think about. That's all to do. You're saying the seventh point in the sequence of thirds is also the fourteenth point in the sequence of sixths. That means you look at pictures and say, are those two points the same point on the number line? Any kid can do that. Well, you don't believe it? That's fine. You start with a sequence of thirds. Now this, <coughs> look at this, the black dots are the thirds. Right. <coughs> you want to get a sequence of sixths, you divide any one of the small segments into two equal parts. See that? Right. And once you do that, the unit segment, zero to one, is now divided into <coughs> six equal parts, two times three. You do that, now you count, count this. Now I won't count it, right, but um, you can do it. Then you count it, all, all of them, all the sequence of six, that is exactly the 14th point. Now, try it. Well, you can see it. There are seven of the thirds. You have half all the thirds, so you have 14 of the sixth. That's and that's it. That is the reason why the theorem on the equivalent fractions is true. So simple. That's what happens when you do things right. It simplifies. That's the whole point of doing things right. Now well, try another one. Same thing. Six fifths. That means so three times five, three times six, right? So again, there's no thinking involved in you. The whole point about mathematics is you want to minimize thinking as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the whole truth. <coughs> and so this tells you, say, you follow directions, right? 351 is the fifth point in the sequence of sixth. 15 over 18 is the 15th point in the sequence of 18th. Just do it. It's a non-thinking issue. So you do it exactly the same way. So again, the blacks represent the sequence of uh, uh, division into uh, six equal parts, and then the, 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 I, I added 
each of these, right, so that we subdivide it into three equal parts, that means every sixth subdivided into three equal parts, that means well, the unit set might not divide into 18 <coughs> equal parts, and you count 5 over 6 is exactly 15, 15 points in the sequence of 18. That's the theorem on equivalent fractions. And of course, you can see that. If I give you more examples, right? This is good exactly the same. This gets boring. So the general proof can be written out exactly the same way. There's no point doing it, especially if you're teaching fifth grader. Lots of examples, they're convinced of it. They see the reasoning, and you just say, well, that's always true. That's it. Now, there's an immediate application. Instead of simplifying fractions, I want to, oh, what do you call it? Instead of simplifying, you say complexifying? <coughs> I, two and seven and five and four. Well, I give two fractions here. It's complicated because this is what? Two sevenths. This is five fourths. They are very different animals, by the way, right? Two sevenths. Sevenths. One seventh is some. No? You don't quite know what it is, but seven. And five fourths is one fourth. Yeah, one fourth. They have accepted that. How does one seventh compare with one fourth? It's complicated. But the theorem on the equivalent fractions allows you to simplify the whole situation. You never need to stare at two fractions with unequal denominators because 2 7 is exactly the same as this, correct? 5 fourths is exactly the same as this fraction. If that's the case, look at the denominator, they're the same now. Now this is a very important psychological uh, it's psychological, yes, but it's it mathematical, really. It allows you to think correctly. Maybe now you don't often have to, you don't often come, uh, you're not often up against two fractions with different denominators. But if you are, psychologically, you're way ahead of the case. Namely, namely, namely they look complicated. Except I know in my own mind they're not complicated. Why? Because. <coughs> I can think of them as two fractions with the same denominator. That saves lives. Right? Now keep this in mind. So in general, then you're given two fractions, right? So I'm stating the, uh, 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 this principle. Given two fractions like this. Well, you know this m over n is exactly the same as this because, right, this, this multiply top and bottom by l. m over k. Well, multiply top and bottom by n, you get this. But you see now the two fractions now, same denominator. So the, we call this FLFP, meaning that fundamental fact of fraction pairs. In your own mind, any two fractions are just two fractions with the same denominator. Now you think that this sort of gimmick is not a gimmick. It's fundamental truth. It saves wear and tear of the brain many times. So we'll see. All right, now we add fractions. We're ready to add fractions. <coughs> First, now, this is the coherence part. When you do fractions, don't think, I don't mean you, I mean, tell them, don't think that you're doing something different. You're doing more or less the same as in whole numbers. You know whole numbers, you're ready for fractions. That's a big psychological barrier removed. So now, how, in what way? So let's see how you add whole numbers. Well, of course, in, a, in grade two, grade one, you say you count, right? you combine and count. And but you can, in terms of the number line, it's much easier. You concatenate two segments, one of length four, one of length three, and now you say, what is the total length of the concatenated segment? Well, count. That's Seven. That, that is the meaning, that's the geometric meaning of ad adding whole numbers. Adding whole number means the total length of the concatenation of those two segments of the given length. Right? Now, if you have prepared your students to say whole numbers are not different from fractions, then you come to four-fifths and three-fifths, 
You want to add? What do you tell them? It's a slight code number. What is it? What, is, what does it mean? First of all, you have to know what it means. What it means is, what, it's good for whole numbers, it's good for this, okay? I'm going to tell you, the length, I don't know what it is, but it's the length of the concatenation of a segment of four-fifths and a segment of three-fifths. Is it, isn't it reasonable? Exactly as in whole numbers, right? Once you've done that, now you sit back and say, you want the total length. How can you miss? What's the total length? You're combining four segments of length one fifth and three segments of length one fifth. How many are there? Think of, are you combining four marbles and three marbles? What is it? Uh, seven marbles, right? One fifth, so it's seven of the fifths. Seven fifth, that's exactly what seven or five means. So it's so wonderful. It's wonderful. In this case, you just do it. Just at the top. Just at the top. Adding two fractions with the same denominator is a piece of cake. Or a piece of pizza, if you want. <laughs> Just add the numerator. And you're not adding it because someone told you and didn't explain it to you. No, 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 no. You figure it out yourself. That's the only reasonable thing under the sun to do. Right? That's what we want to happen. I have 20 more minutes, right? Yeah. 20 more minutes? Is that right? Uh, what's it, Miss? Tim? Uh, Jim? Is it 20 more minutes? Do I have 20 more minutes? Yeah, 20 more. Okay, I'll, 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 okay. I'll, I'll get it back. Okay, so now that's the easy part. I have two fractions with same denominators at the top. But, and you're completely convinced that this is nothing different from whole numbers. It's completely reasonable. It's combining things, right? All that is important. Next one. Okay, that's really a summary, right? So, just to summarize what I just said. Okay. Now, the next thing is, of course, take two complicated things. Four sevenths and two fifths of the, the, the problem we started with. First, what does it mean? Well, the meaning is not going to change. It's the concat length of the concatenation. <coughs> Combining things, that is not going to change. Adding is always combining things. All right? Now, except, now you're going to say, okay, that's the meaning. Wonderful. Except, what is it? You're stuck. Because that's kind of hard. It's like saying, uh, yeah, I think I have it written down. It's like saying, yeah, four sevenths and two fifths, they refer to different things. It's like saying four feet and two meters. How long is it? It's hard. You have to, need to convert in the same unit. However, you know F and FP, right? As I said, when you see two fractions like this, you have no fear. In your own mind, you dismiss them as what? Two fractions with the same denominator. Therefore, when you add them, I pay no mind. I, in, in my own mind, I immediately convert them to two, two fractions of the same denominator. In this situation, I know how to add, namely, add the numerator. Done. This is how you add fractions. Not this LCD nonsense. Now, strictly combining things. Strictly. No LCD. And that, in general, is that's what happens. That's, 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 that's why this is the general formula. Works under any condition. Yeah? So that's it. That's nothing more to be said about adding fractions. Now I'm going to I'm, I'm improvise a little bit. We talk about coherence or mathematics. Textbooks tell you how to add fractions like this. Well, K, L, M, N, all of these our whole number, right? After that, I want you to think hard and realize what has been happening in your, how you've been mistreated by TSM. <laughs> Look, you, you've added, the textbooks only teach you how, TSM only teaches you how to add fractions when, when KL and MN are all whole numbers. 
But later on, the minute you get to 6th grade, 7th grade, 9th grade, 10th grade, you start to add these when K, L, M, N first, when they are integer, plus, negative, or positive. And then later on, when K, L, M, N are decimals, and when K, L, M, N are fractions, and in fact, much worse, when K, L, M, N are arbitrary numbers. For example, when you do computations with volumes of spheres and all that, haven't you seen square root of 2, square root of 3 among the numerators and denominators? You have. How do you add them? By road. They never explain it. This, however, this is a formula that works regardless of whether K and N are fractions, rational numbers, irrational numbers, complex numbers. It doesn't matter what numbers. It's going to, always going to work. Okay. Now, okay, just to illustrate. You want to use LCD? Okay, look at these two fractions. Well, of course, the LCD of 6, uh, is 24, right? And you get this. But we don't use LCD. What happens? You just multiply 6 and 8, 48. You get that. Is this different from that? No, not at all. So what's the big deal about this? What's the point? No point. Yeah, so textbooks tell you the wrong things. Okay, now so one more uh, uh, observation. If you want to prove that adding fractions is community, satisfies the community law, satisfies the associative law, good luck when you try to add fractions using LCD. Have you ever tried it? It's hideous. But you know adding fractions is concatenation, right? Well, on that basis, it's obvious. Adding fractions. That's a little bit more because same, same length, same length, same length. And associated more, you know, three segments and put them together. So when you do things right, so many things fall out easily. That's the, of course, that's the reward for doing things correctly. Yeah. So don't use LCD, please. Not for, but LCD is a special skill. Everyone, everyone, should, everyone should acquire it sooner or later. There's no question. There are certain examples that illustrate that if you don't use LSD, the conversation gets messy. But it has nothing to do with the concept of adding fractions. Okay. So, that, so this is about, uh, well, it summarizes what I've been saying about why we should emphasize that fractions are a direct continuation of whole numbers. It builds up students' confidence, makes them feel that mathematics is learnable, learnable, learnable. They don't stop making sense. They're willing to go along. All of mathematics should be like this. But school mathematics almost never is. Okay. Uh, so that's I wonder now to review. I listed five things that are sort of abstract and you know no, think about it. We have exemplified every single one of them. Think about it. And that's exactly how you think about the practice then. You have done the mathematics, they mean something. When you don't, when you have not done the mathematics, you just keep pontificating about practice standard one, practice standard two, practice standard n, you mean nothing. Okay. Now, so I'm going to shift gear, about 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. So I have to be a little bit sketchy in the next minute because I'm running out of time. So, uh, well, let's try. Geometry, congruence and similarity. I'll be a little fast, all right? So put up with me. I want you to reflect on the fact that this is a, there is a horrible discontinuity in the teaching of geometry in school mathematics. How you treat congruence and similarity in middle school and congruence and similarity in high school, they're completely different things. In middle school, what about, first of all, same size, same shape is congruent. Same shape but not necessarily the same size is similarity. As I tried to explain to you last, in the last hour, they are really not method. They are not precise enough to be definition. They may believe that you have learned something by using these terms, but in fact you have learned nothing because you cannot use it. Now, 
I want to point out one more thing. And that's a very bad part of TSM, namely congruence, like uh, uh, reflections, rotation, all these things, they are used for artistic purposes in middle school. Uh, have you heard of Escher prints? Mm -hmm. yeah. Have you heard of the stained glass windows of mosques? You know, the translational symmetry, all that. They are fun. I agree. What, ha what has that got to do with mathematics? <coughs> That's the issue. And then certainly what happens when you go to high school? Uh, okay. When you go to high school, what happens to congruence and similarity? Well, you never talk about congruence and similarity. <laughs> figures that do not have straight edges, what we call rectilinear. That's, uh, <laughs> what is it? Mm, I, anyway, you come there. You only talk about polygons, right? <coughs> so and you talk about similarity and congruence using what? Size of angles and length of sides. Now, what about one parabola? How is that similar to another parabola? What's going to happen to that? Do you have angles to measure? No. Do you have lengths to measure? No. So what happens? Well, school mathematics says, None of my business. <laughs> <laughs> you should notice this horrible of this continuity. And how do you think, how do you inspire students to make sense of mathematics when you have this cut off after middle school and say, certainly you go to another, as if you go to another country, speaking another di uh, uh, language, as if nothing has happened. You just put up with it. You, just, you have to put up with it. And so, so CCSSM has set out to remedy this uh, curriculum defect. That's one of the main things. Many, the many, right? So what happens is in high school you use axioms. Oh yeah, here's your, oh, there's, let's see, um, polygons, yeah. So equal angles, like all that, rectilinear. That's what I was trying to, I was trying to use. Uh, yeah, rectilinear means it's, uh, everything is straight, uh, broken, but straight. But, so, yeah, for example, uh, any two circles are similar. Everybody believes it because, because same shape, right? Precisely why? You don't even know what similar means. So wh wh why do you believe that two circles are similar? That's a problem, right? So we have to change that. Yeah, so that, uh, that's important we are putting it. Yeah, first it's metaphor, and then later on you just ignore it and start all over again. That is really not good. Uh, in terms of, I mean, the, all these obvious things are really staring you in the face, and we're just ignoring it for generations. And so, why would you teach high school geometry abstractly as a set of axioms? What happens? Well, there's a reaction. To, to every action, there's a reaction. In the 1990s, I think maybe some of you were at the, yourselves taught by such textbooks. Geometry with no proofs, but only lots of activities, lots of picture drawing, lots of geometry softwares, no proofs. Has anyone, was anyone taught by this? No? Okay. Some of your students came through this program, such programs. And so that was supposed to be uh, very, very, uh, <coughs> fashionable for a long time. So that should be something better than one extreme to the other extreme, and there's no golden mean. So what, CC is, what the common core standards try to do is to establish a golden mean if possible. And so the approach is the following. In eighth grade, eighth grade really is a critical grade for teaching of Many things, I'll come to that in a minute, but for teaching of geometry. It insists, it specifies clearly that it's to be taught informally, meaning that don't insist on total precision, but teach enough so that students can still follow you, of course, right? Now, of course, that's a very, very delicate balance, but that's, that's a, second, a separate issue. You teach transitions, reflections, and rotations, and dilations in grade eight. The value of teaching those things is that they are 
uh, what you call hands-on activities. Every one of them can be. Uh, by the way, so if you teach violation correctly, you can ask them to dilate. Ah, okay. <laughs> dilate an ellipse into one of double the size. Now, if you don't know how you don't you, have, you don't know the precise definition of dilation, it's going to be very hard. I don't know. Have you ever tried it? Try it at home. How do you dilate an ellipse into one of double the size? <coughs> Once you learn about dilation, well, you do it. And I think it's usually, it's really a crowd pleaser, so to speak. They love it. The ch students in eighth grade, they just never thought of doing it so simply, and they now learn it. They can't wait to dilate everything under the sun. <laughs> uh, so anyway, now, so in eighth grade, you your informal definition of translation, reflection, rotation, and dilation using lots of manipulatives. Here is where manipulatives are decreed, forced on you, meaning that well, that's the only way you can do geometry reasonably in eighth grade. Everything is correct, except details are missing. So that's okay if you teach mathematics that way. Everything is correct, only details are missing. You replace a lot of technical details by hands-on activities, that's fine. So law is, is understood, that's what's happening. Once you've done that, they have a fairly robust conception of ro uh, rotation, uh, reflection, translation. You use those to define congruence. A congruence, nothing but a combination of rotation, translation, whatever, yeah, those two, three things together. Finite number of them. That's precise meaning or congruence. This is not something made up for school mathematics. This is mainstream mathematics. This is how mathematicians think about congruence. So that's all there is to it. It's entirely correct. And this been, by the way, none of this is new. This is standard mathematics. It, it, in other words, in, 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 in higher level, it's how we think of congruence and similarity. <coughs> what we do is to use manipulatives manipulative to bring it down to the level of middle school and teach it correctly. That's all there is to it. Could have been, could have been done, I would say, 50 years ago, but it just wasn't done. And of course, and we do all that not for fun. It's not for fun. It's not for doing transformational geometry. None of that. It's a means to an end. The end is what? To understand congruence, understand similarity. And on this basis, you can understand the standard things for SAS, SASA, so on, for congruence. And then uh, the most important thing about similarity is, oh, so similarity is a congruence, oh, no, okay, it's a dilation followed by a congruence. That's similarity. And for that, you, it's possible to make sense of so-called angle-angle criterion, in, meaning you have two triangles with two pairs of equal angles. They are similar. That's the critical fact that's needed for many things, and I'll come to that in a minute. Yeah, I still have some time. So, in high school, what happens? <coughs> well, you don't radically change it. No, we don't do that. We want continuity. So what do you do? You do exactly the same thing what you have done in grade 8, except more precision. Fill in detail. Exactly the same progression. Define translation correctly, define reflection correctly, define rotation correctly, define dilation correctly. And then you do exactly the same thing as before. What is a congruent? Well, composition of uh, tra translation, di uh, reflection, and rotation. What's, what's congruent? Uh, 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 what is uh, similarity? Similarity means a dilation followed by a congruence. Every, see, we don't tell lies. We just sort of omit some details. That's acceptable. That's acceptable pedagogy. Right? And then what happened is that we don't no longer pussyfoot around. We now you use these definitions of congruence and similarity to prove the favorite items. S A S S S A E S A H L and level similarity A A S A S S S A prove all of them. Once you prove all of them, you are L you're well on your way to do geometry in any which way you want. And of course what they specify in the common core standards is you begin to prove theorems. 
you have a firm foundation for doing it. Now, in a little bit of time, I want to at least get to this issue. So first of all, the whole point of this is we want to make geometry learnable and teachable. That's all. Nothing about to engaging in orgies about a transformation geometry. Nothing, none of that. None of that. It's, it's all this is means to an end, to enlarge your under, a student's understanding. But there's a critical reason. So this factors into the thinking of the common core. Namely, we have to do that in grade eight because why? Grade eight you begin to teach equations, uh, linear equations in two variables, this one. And the most fundamental part of that, of course, everybody knows is that you not just the manipulation of the algebraic equation, but the graph of the algebraic equation and all the properties about per the perpendicularities, uh, uh, parallel lines and simultaneous linear equations, all those things. You cannot teach all that without first having a firm conception of what slope is. What is slope? Ah, there again is a question. What is slope? Well, TSM says, okay. Yeah, uh, okay. I have no time, so I put this. Okay, slope. TSM says, this is what slope is. Take a line, take two points, right over the run, period. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Well, there's plenty wrong with it. Everything is wrong with it because what? You take two other points. You do right over run. Do you know whether the right over run of ABC is the same as PQR? <laughs> if not, so what, what on earth do you mean by slope? Slope of what? Slope of the line or slope of the 2, 1, P, and Q? That for 50 years. No, maybe 40. 40. Textbooks of the last 40 years never make that even engage students to, into thinking about this. They just say, well, that's pick two points, right over run, that's it. That's ruinous. That's educationally ruinous. That's why you need so much le unhappy, unhappy learning by rote. You memorize the equation of this, memorize the equation of that. Everything's happening because Slope is not defined correctly. If you don't define it correctly, you cannot explain why the graph of a linear equation is a line. Have, well, has anyone here seen a proof in the textbook of why the graph of x plus b equal c, why that graph is a straight line? All I've ever seen is plot enough points and what? Isn't that a straight line? Isn't it? <laughs> That's not the way to do mathematics, is it? Now, but that is okay if you know, true still learn. But the whole point is that students are not learning algebra. Students are not learning slow. And so I, let me go back to that. that, that uh, you, some of you, I stop so they can take, take notes. Uh, there's an article, research article by uh, Posnico and Greenis about what is so hard about learning linear equations. <coughs> Most of the students said, we cannot find the slope of the line. Now, come on. The line there, you're going to find the slope. Right over run, right? Probe into that. Why does this happen? And you see it. By not teaching slope correctly, you're ruining a whole generation of students. OK, so now, so that, uh, that pretty much, uh, my time is up. So uh, I give you an indication why Common Core shapes the teaching of geometry in middle school and high school in this particular fashion. Now, these are the sort of two of the main reasons, the need for linear equation, study of linear equation, and to make the concept of similarity and congruence at least teachable and learnable. OK, thank you. I was just asked, and uh, we're going to get a copy of his presentation. So everyone that has come, giving you email, so we can electronically send them to you.
We also have some of his other papers over here, some miscellaneous ones there if you're interested. They're not the kind of presentations he's given in the past. So I just wanted to make sure. So if you've given your email, then we'll have the secretary. I'll download them here and get them. So if you want the electronic version, I think most people would probably like that. So that would help. Okay. The other thing we'd like to do uh, before we break for lunch, just to make mention that we do have an uh, evaluation form, assessment. So you get to assess us in this symposium. We'd like to value your feedback. So if you can over lunch or so, uh, towards the end fill that out, or if you have to leave early, downstairs there'll be a box that you can drop them in. So if, there, if you could do that, that would be very helpful for us as well. And other than that, I guess we can break for lunch right now, and uh, we'll be back shortly. Thank you.